Well, good morning and welcome to our live stream service for Southside Bible Church. My name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at the church, and we have been studying the Romans together. So if you'll turn to Romans chapter 3, last week we finished up Romans chapter 2. It's been kind of a rough chapter as Paul is unmasking the religious hypocrite. And the Word of God, uh, it cuts deeply into our remaining sin. It cut off flesh that was kind of growing over my own heart again, making it less sensitive to the glories of Christ. And so thank God for that. I, I feel like I almost had cataract surgery with, a, with this uh, beautiful view now of the cross that I just read in Romans 3, 21 through 31. We're the true circumcision who put no confidence in the flesh and we glory in Christ Jesus alone. Uh, one of my dear elders uh, Joel George, he bought me a new shirt. So you probably already figured it out. I don't usually wear a t-shirt, but it, what, it, what it says is I, I survived Romans 2. And I'm not going to take off my jacket, but on the back it says, but now. And so that's where we're journeying, guys. We got through chapter 2, and now we're moving into chapter 3. So my goal this morning, Lord willing, uh, is Romans 3, 1 through 8. Uh, just a little introduction to this passage. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones says it's probably the toughest verse in Romans, and he, he said maybe even the whole Bible. A couple of preachers said Romans 9 is not the toughest chapter in Romans, but surely the passage that we're on this morning is the most difficult to interpret. 20 years ago, I joyfully set out to understand Paul's argument and studied it longer than any passage in Romans. And I came out a little timid, but I had to put a sermon together, and I stood and preached it. And after I preached it, I got a call from one of our members in the church. He was a true Barnabas, and he said, my wife said on the drive home from church, well, that was a complete waste of a Sunday. <laughs> Thank you, brother. So my joy today is at least you didn't have the drive time. So if it's as bad as 20 years ago, you, know, you didn't have to drive except the worship team and the AVL. And by the way, AVL team, we have a new member sitting here, uh, Dalton Klepper, is back from COVID-19. Good to have our brother back. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies to that beautiful family. Well, let's uh, take it up then in, in, in prayer, and we will look at Romans 3, 1 through 8. Father God, I come and I do. I ask for your mercies. Lord, there's something um, beautiful for us to behold in the Word of God. You give us tough passages and their purposes and their reasons uh, you, you never have given us your word uh, willy-nilly, but there's, there's something that you want to do in our mind and our hearts in shaping us this morning. And so, God, I pray that you would do just that. I pray that you would take uh, your, your instrument and just use now your word. Lord, let it come forth in truth and let it uh, do your intended purpose in each heart here this morning. God, meet us. Let it be a time of worship. Amen. Well, Paul just got done dismantling the Jew who he's been resting in, the, in his privilege, but not in the salvation that the privilege pointed to. He, he stopped short of Christ and, and just took the privileges and, and thought that was salvation. All of their lives had been built upon Torah and circumcision and their Jewishness that they were the people of God. And they looked down upon Gentiles who were not the people of God. They were pagans and they were immoral. And Paul just masterfully pulled the rug out from under them so that they would fall upon Christ. Not to just destroy him, but to show them and make them fall on the Savior and his righteousness that's revealed in this gospel that Paul is not ashamed of. He, he wants them to have the righteousness that will get them into salvation, will get them through God's judgment. And so he's not just doing this to be mean. He showed that they, they did not give hearty approval to Genesis 1, to the, to the Gentiles who just sinned and rejected God. They, they condemned it, and yet Paul says they did the same. On Judgment Day, their lives are going to be exposed and laid bare before God with the truth. And even the secrets of their hearts are going to be open before God and there'll, there'll be no more hypocrisy. It's all open and laid bare on that day. So you can teach the word, he says, but you, you don't do it. You can't keep the law. 
You've not used Torah for what it was to be a a mirror to show you the glories and beauties of Christ, but to reflect and show you your sin and you need a savior to show you that you're a transgressor of God's will. You think that being circumcised makes you a son of Abraham and thus a child of promise with eternal life and a great hope. But a true Jew last week, Paul says, is circumcised in the heart. And now you love God and you seek to follow him and to be pleasing to him from the heart. Christianity is from the inside to the outside. And you're now faced with one of two possibilities. Maybe more, but just two that I want to look at. You're faced with the possibility then is to see that you have no true righteousness. You cannot keep the law to be justified and right with God. And the only hope is to flee to Christ for this salvation and this righteousness that he offers to us in Christ. And the second option is you can become a spin doctor and you can just start turning arguments and, and saying, what, what about dinosaurs? What, what about, you know, you just, you just start twisting everything and, and try your hardest to keep hiding from God and say he's, he's not telling the truth. The, there's contradictions in the scriptures. And you can just keep spinning and avoiding God in that way. And that is what we will see the Jews were doing in Paul's day. So Paul knew the arguments. He had the same ones. He he had encountered them many times uh, again and again. And he will become an an apologist now in this section. And he'll take on arguments that that they've been fighting the truth with. They're they're fighting God's truth. And Paul's going to dismantle it not to just win an argument. Please hear that. Your, Your goal is not just to win an argument against someone, but to save a soul. A Jewish soul that Paul said, I, if I could be a curse that they could be saved, I would be my fellow Jews. That's the heart of this man. I want them to be saved. I want them to come to Jesus Christ for this great salvation that is in him alone. Well, what would you suppose would be some of the arguments then that a, a Jew might bring to Paul at this point of what we've been studying in Romans? Well, Paul knew from experience some of the most common objections, and I want you to hear them. (coughs) Acts 21, 28, crying out, men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man, Paul, who preaches to all men everywhere against our people, the Jews, and the law, and this place, the temple. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple, and he's defiled this holy place that God has given us. And Acts 26, 19, before King Agrippa. Consequently, Paul says, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple, and they tried to put me to death. And so having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. All of that pointing to Jesus Christ, and they wanted to kill him because of this gospel and what we've been learning in the last couple of weeks. So here's my question this morning. Is it possible that Paul went too far in trying to show that both Jews and Gentiles are guilty and in need of salvation? (laughs) Is there any advantage to being a Jew? Maybe you went too far and you over-argued. Why the Old Testament? Why Abraham? Why this special covenant? Why circumcision at all? Why the temple? Why two-thirds of our Bibles? Aren't these pointless then, Paul? I mean, God chose for himself a nation. as the, the people of his own possession. Israel, from the seed of Abraham, they're just so privileged. The origin of this nation was Abraham, the believer, who was declared righteous before God. The nations will be blessed through your seed, And it'll be as numerous as the the sands on the seashore. 
their great rescue from Egypt with the 10 plagues and the Red Sea swallowing up the Egyptian army, the, the giving of the law and Moses, the promised land that God brought them into, the Davidic dynasty and the, the temple for worship and the, the promise of a Messiah, the nation of Israel, the most privileged people on the face of the earth. Paul just took all that they've been resting upon, all the privilege that they've ever known their whole lives and history, and he just blew it out of the water. You sank my battleship. Boom. Done. And so the argument is quite simply, are you saying, Paul, then there's no real advantage then to being a Jew? Circumcision, there was nothing, the Torah, the history... That's got to be answered. You just can't throw away two-thirds of history and say none of it mattered, Paul. That can't, that can't work. And so what I want to do this morning then is take up Paul's arguments to take down the, the last arguments of the religious that he's been showing us. So this morning, your outline is we're going to look at three anticipated objections to what Paul has just said in the previous chapter, uh, starting in verse 18 with the Jews. So your outline is, is they're saying, Paul, you're attacking God's people. Secondly, you're attacking God's promises. And then you're attacking God's purity. And we will take a look at those three this morning. <clears throat> the first objection, Paul, you're attacking God's people. Look with me in Romans 3.1. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? What what advantage of having Torah and and God giving us circumcision? Paul, you've you've got to be off your rocker. Psalm 135, 4, For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. They're they're my people. And this made many of the Jews think because of that, that they were in the kingdom. They were in with God because of their privileges. And Paul's answer is, What would you expect his answer to be after chapter 2? Paul, what advantage has the Jew? I expect him to say, not a whole lot. (laughs) Not much. But his answer is great in every respect. I just blew it all out of the water, so what's the advantage? Great. Great in every respect. First of all, there's an anticipated list now that he's going to give, but in this passage, he only gives one reason. So great advantage is, Here they come, and he only gives us one, and I think he answers the rest in Romans 9, and we'll be moving to that eventually. So you were entrusted, here's the reason then, you were entrusted with the oracles of God, and and God made an exclusive covenant with them. He gave them the Holy Land, their lineage, the Savior came from it, but here the main thing that Paul's going to draw out is you were entrusted with the oracles of God. And the problem with that is the Jews missed the high privilege meant a high responsibility. To be given the the only special revelation on the face of the earth was, was the highest of privilege. But it brought a responsibility to heed it and hear it and believe it. And that's where they missed it. Listen to Amos 3, 2. You only, Israel, have I chosen among the families of the earth Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. All of your privilege, because you're so privileged, I will punish you for your iniquities. Isaiah 5, 4, that beautiful parable uh, where he makes the land and gets it all fertile. He says, what more was there that I could do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then when I expected to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? All, All the privilege, everything that God gave you, Israel, was to bear good fruit, and all that came out was rotten fruit. You were entrusted with the very word of God, and you blew it. You thought having the word of God brought you salvation instead of believing in the one revealed in that word who could bring salvation from cover to cover. Messiah's promise shown, revealed, and you thought just having it was enough. One period of history, you lost the oracles. Hilkiah, the high priest, stumbled onto him. The time of Christ, man-made traditions had more weight than the oracles of God, the things they made up on their own. They had the very word of God that showed God's salvation, 
that revealed Messiah. They had it. You can't get that from creation. And you were privileged to have that and to look and find, you find at the day of Jesus, there were some, the Annas and Simeons who were waiting for the promise and the consolation of Israel. So there were some that, that did see Christ would come and they were waiting and hoping, but most and that day had missed it. So what advantage to being a Jew? And I'll ask you this, what advantage to being in a church what advantage to being raised in a Christian home? <clears throat> well, you get the air shot to hear the Word of God. And Paul's going to say later in this book, faith comes by hearing. You had God's heart, you had His revelation. And to get so close to the Word of God and not believe, to, to, to look at this Word as a rule book to climb to heaven, or just a good moral compass, or a book of right and wrong, or Aesop's fables. In Hebrews 4, let us fear lest while a promise remains of entering his rest in this book, in Jesus, that any one of you should seem to come short of it. For indeed, we had good news preached to us, Jews, promised uh, wandering wilderness, that they also, but the word they heard, it didn't profit them because it was not united in faith with those who heard it. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. And so it's not enough to just have Bibles. It's not enough to, to study them and try to go keep the law and be good people. That is, what, that is what Israel did. And Paul's trying to show you that righteousness will never get you saved. But this book that you've been given reveals another kind of righteousness in Jesus Christ who came and fulfilled the law. What a privilege to, to hold a Bible that reveals God's salvation. And if you don't believe it, and you just look at it as moral ways to make you better, you destroy the whole gospel. And that is what Israel had done. You had the word that showed you God's salvation in Jesus. Abraham believed that God would do everything necessary to save him and make him righteous. <clears throat> and now you think just cutting your flesh, some external circumcision makes you right with God as you try to keep the law. The great privilege of having the word of God, you don't stop short that having a Bible saves you. What this speaks to the multitudes in our land. We live in a land that is starved for true faith in this gospel. And many will go into church, not this morning, but when it opens up again, many will walk into churches week after week with tradition. And they'll never believe in the Christ that's revealed in this word. And that is what the Jews were doing. You were given the oracles of God this word for oracles is used four times in the New Testament, and it meant divine sayings. The sacred utterances emanating from God. A good way to translate it would be the speech of God. Listen to Psalm 147, verse 19 and 20. He declares his words to Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his ordinances, they have not known him. There's no other nation than he gave his Bible to, his revelation. Oh, Israel, the privilege to have the revelation of God. <coughs> Let this take your breath away. This book changes from a collection of writings to God's words. God breathed, and we tremble at the word of God. And just to pull out for a second, the application to us is this word of God is under attack. And we live in the day of relativism and no absolutes and marriage, genders, feminism, racism, male chauvinism. It's all just permeated the church. And someone just needs to say enough and say, thus saith the Lord and preach this word. No one dies for truth anymore. Nothing's essential. We have been entrusted with the oracles of God, and that is what started the Reformation with Martin Luther.
I believe that every jot and tittle in this book is the Word of God. And I better bow to it. And if I don't like what it says, I need to change, not change the Word of God. Treasure this book for what it is and meditate on it day and night. I've hidden it in my heart that I won't sin against you. Jeremiah said, I took it and I ate it. Has this become a textbook? Or is it the oracles of God, of God's salvation? And so I cry to us who um, lose sight of that. That's Christians. We have the Bible, the full revelation of God. And I pray that we treasure it and we don't think by just having it makes us saved. Believe in the Christ who's revealed in this book. That's for free. Jews, you've been given the very oracles of God that promise salvation. It promised that you could be in a relationship with God. And it guided them in his paths, the ancient paths. And they thought having the book was enough. Just making it like any other religion. Every cult is just a rule book from God. That's all they did. Another rule book, how to get right with God. But I want you to go back to Romans 1, 2. In verse 1, I'm set apart for the gospel of God, which God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son. Promised beforehand. The Scriptures. This is what your Bibles showed you, Jewish brethren. Salvation. He promised a new covenant. And that Bible, it said, I'll circumcise your heart as we saw last week. We saw that it would come through the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. There's such advantage to the one who only had general revelation. It was given to the Jews to embrace and receive Christ. That's what it revealed and promised, that you would be saved. And so, Paul, are you attacking God's people? No. No, he's pointing God's people to the gift that God gave them that they would find the Messiah. Second, second objection. Paul, you're attacking God's promises. Let's take a look. <clears throat> Verse 3, what then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. May it never be. So here is the big argument. You ready? The Jewish people had so much privilege and promise. But the fact is, some don't believe what you're saying, Paul. If the Jews are perishing, isn't God unfaithful to his people since he made a covenant with them and he made promises? He made big promises to them. And if those promises just vanish... God is unfaithful to what he said he would do to the Jewish nation. The integrity and truth of God now is being questioned by the Jews and many who have ever followed since. And the big question is in Romans 9 through 11, he's going to answer it in detail. But let's dig in on this. <clears throat> what then if some did not believe? Some, I think, is a very kind word by Paul. Try most. Most did not believe. In Romans 9 through 11, Paul said there's just a, a remnant who believed. But some, most Jewish people did not believe this gospel when Paul penned these words. So in Romans 2, the Jewish people are guilty of not keeping the law. They couldn't fulfill it in their own doings. And in Romans 3, they're guilty of not believing it as well. They would not believe in Messiah that was promised in this word. What Paul is saying is this. God entrusted the Jews with the oracles of God. And most have not believed like Abraham. The mark of Abraham uh, is what they're looking at instead of his faith of Abraham. And so these Jews are not believing the father of the whole nation, what he believed that God would bring salvation. And so the question is, did the word of God fail then? God has not brought his people into Zion. All the promises that were given in the Old Testament have not happened. And Paul's argument is this. Their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? In the Greek, you have this particle may, and it anticipates a negative response. And so, uh, will their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? No. No, it will not. And I want you to think about this for a second. 
Because none of us would really just say this out loud. <clears throat> but sometimes the same thing comes, I hear it from New Testament people. Look at the world. There's just so few Christians. I was in Europe a while ago and where the Reformation once roared. It's just dead, dead, cold, orthodoxy, unbelief. Turkey and all that region where Paul preached is now a Muslim stronghold. I look at America and the decay and what has happened to the gospel in our own land. America needs the gospel. Has God failed? The Jews did not believe the very promises from the oracles that they were entrusted with. Does their unbelief nullify the promises of God is the question. To save and to redeem a people for himself. And so I want you to get this. Our unfaithfulness cannot nullify the faithfulness of God. That is a beautiful promise. Our unfaithfulness cannot nullify the faithfulness of God. And listen to what Paul says in verse 4. May Genetai, he's going to use that many times here in Romans. It means may it never be. It's the strongest negative Greek expression. Um, perish the thought. It's impossible. No way, Jose. It's, it cannot happen. The unfaithfulness of man cannot nullify the faithfulness of God. And Paul declares right here in this verse then, rather, let God be found true, though every man be found to be a liar. Just a dogmatic declaration. God is true. The commentator Cranfield says, we confess God is true. God is faithful. He's true to his word and he's true to his promises. He's faithful to all the promises that he makes in a covenant. He keeps them. He can never deny himself. And so make sure that you get what Paul is saying. God's not the problem here. We are. There's not a problem with God. He's faithful and true. But we're the problem, though every man be found to be a liar. Every man, a liar. We're liars and spin doctors and deceivers and suppressors of truth. The psalmist says, we come out of the womb speaking lies. This whole world is built on lies. The coronavirus, we can't even get truth. We're the problem, not God. God is true. And what are we? Liars. There's where the problem is. God is always going to be true. He'll always be faithful. But we're liars and spin doctors and deceivers, and we're just fighting God. The problem isn't with God. God is true, and he can re never renege on his word. His nature demands that he will fulfill his word on every promise. <clears throat> what a blessing in the land of deceit and lying. But there's this one place I can always come to for truth. And so if every human being said this, God is unfaithful and does not keep his word, I'll tell you this, God is faithful and true, and everyone else is a liar. God's truth, truthfulness cannot be violated. It's its very attribute, essence, and nature. So here's the argument. Despite Israel's unbelief, God is faithful. And Paul answers it in two ways. God is faithful to his word in this way. God will save all who have the faith of Abraham. And that will never go away. God, God will save everyone who in bare faith believes the gospel. But secondly, here's where the break fell through. God's faithfulness will punish those who do not believe and walk in unrighteousness. God is going to be faithful to condemn those who reject the Son. He's faithful. He will save and He will judge based on what you do with Jesus Christ. He's faithful. That's where the Jew missed it. They only had one set of thinking for God's faithfulness. And all it was was blessing from them being Jews. And, and so just we're going to be blessed because we're the seed of Abraham. And they didn't realize that God would be faithful to judge the hypocrite that we saw in chapter 2. Cover to cover of this book, Old Testament, New Testament, God will be faithful to judge. Much like America today. 
for somewhere we got it in our heads that we're the covenant people of God and God's going to just bless America. God bless America while we kill babies and lie and murder, all the stuff. Come bless America. Where you get that from? It's the same mindset. All God can do is bless America. It doesn't matter that we, we're, we're fake, phony, get them out of schools, reject them, hate them, just throw them out. But God bless America. That's the way the Jews thought. We're Jews. God's got to bless us. It doesn't matter that we're hypocrites and phony and fake. Worship idols. There's what's going on in this passage. And then in chapter 11, he's also going to say God is faithful that after he brings in all the Gentiles, he's going he's to graft back in the natural branches, the Jews, into this olive tree for his future dealings with Israel. So God's promises have not failed. <clears throat> then, Paul's going to call a witness to what he's saying. This is powerful. There, there's, I, I can't think of a Jew who had more privilege than King David. <laughs> and so now he's, this, is, this is just nasty what Paul's about to do. He's going to call in their great king, David, a man after God's own heart, the king of the nation. Come in, David. And he quotes now Psalm 51, 4 and verse 4. May it never be, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written. And this is David. That you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. This is David's confession after his sin with Bathsheba, 2 Samuel 12. And verse 1, we're told that it was a time when kings go out to battle. <clears throat> David was not where he should have been. He's on the rooftop. He should have been going out to battle, and he's taking a snooze or a rest. And he sees a woman bathing on her roof. He sends a servant, go find out who she is. And the servant says, it's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Uriah was one of the most loyal and faithful soldiers in David's army. Bring her to me, and he commits adultery. And she later says, I'm, I'm pregnant. I'm a child. And so David starts his deceit. How do I cover this up? And he, he brings Uriah home from war and gets him drunk so that he'll go in and sleep with his wife and say, that is where the baby came from. But he didn't. He said, how can I go into my home while the king's servants are out at battle? He has so much integrity. There's no way I'll do that. David tries it again the next night. Same result. Uriah is a man of integrity. You think it would just bring him to his knees. So David tells Joab, the leader of his army, to go violate military protocol, go up against the enemy and run right up to their wall and retreat so that Uriah the Hittite might be killed. And as a result, a number of other soldiers were killed as well. And then David marries Bathsheba to cover it up. And he writes in another psalm during this time, the hand of God was heavy upon me with my guilt. And then God sends the prophet Nathan. And he comes and he tells that beautiful story with the, the one who had all the sheep. And he, he steals that one man's little ewe lamb. And when he takes it, David is outraged. <laughs> And he says, that man deserves to die. And Nathan says, David, you're the man. And Psalm 51 is the king's psalm of repentance. And as he pours out his heart to God, I want to read Psalm 51. A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he'd gone into Bathsheba. Be gracious to me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, this covenantal faithfulness. According to the greatness of thy compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only, I have sinned and done what is evil in thy sight. So that thou, O God, art justified when thou dost speak and blameless when thou dost judge, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin, and in sin my mother conceived me. The king I may be, I'm a man after God's own heart. I've taken down Goliath and I've fought armies. But all the judgment and all the threat and all the punishment for my sin is all on your side, God. So everything you say is right, just, and truthful. You are right to judge me and to condemn me, God. Do you hear that? 
excuse maker. That's how you deal with sin. He didn't sit and play games and he just owned it. God, I'm a sinner and you are right to judge me and to condemn me. David is saying that his unfaithfulness does not ruin God's faithfulness. David will get judgment and the sword will never depart from his house. And so you can say, I keep the law. I have circumcision. I've been baptized. I'm not good enough for heaven, but I'm not bad enough for hell. Or Billy Joel, I'd rather laugh with the sinners and cry with the saints because sinners are much more fun. I want you to hear this. God will keep his promise to save all who will repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will keep his promise to damn all who reject the Son and look to anything else to save them. He's faithful. He will be faithful to that. God will be found true though every other man is a liar, and you you got to deal with that. And if you're a spin doctor this morning, stop. God's faithful in all your dealings and lyings and deceivings and trying to manipulate Scripture and manipulate God. It isn't going to work. And this morning, God's saying, stop. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So he's attacking God's people, Israel. He's attacking God's promises. You can't just quit blessing us. And thirdly, you're attacking God's purity. If you'll look with me in verse 5. But if our unrighteousness <coughs> demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. Paul, are you saying that Israel's sin brings glory to God? You're you're impugning the righteous character of God, that somehow we're bringing glory to God by our sin. And he's going to get into that later in chapter 5 and 6. Furthermore, Paul, if, if man's unrighteousness demonstrates God's righteousness, why would he punish us? If, if we're putting him on display as a righteous God by punishing our unrighteousness, why would he do that? You, you can't judge glorifiers of God. And if we're glorifying God by our unrighteousness, Paul, why would God judge us is the argument. And Paul's going to answer it with three contradictions. You'll look in verse 6. May Ginnatai, may it never be, perish the thought. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? You, you little manipulators. You know God's going to judge the world, Jews. You've already said in chapter 2, let the Gentiles be damned. Let them be judged. God, you're right to judge the Gentile dogs. You believe in a judgment. You're going to have to change your whole theology if you want to play these kind of games with me, says Paul. A major theme is Old Testament judgment. If God condoned sin, how could he judge it? And he just rips them right there just saying, you're just being hypocrites. Now in verse 7, <clears throat> but if through my lie, the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? So here's what's called a condition of unreality for the sake of argument. It's a reversal again in wrestling. They're accusing Paul of sinning by, compla- by um, preaching these truths of the gospel, or the righteousness that comes in Christ alone. And he's going to be judged and Paul's going to be damned. And his simple point is, why is my sin not abounding to God's glory? Now they're saying, Paul, because of your sin, preaching this gospel, you're going to be damned. You're the one who's going to be judged. And he just flips it back on them. Why, Why can't my sin then abound for God's glory like you're already arguing? You see, according to your game, even I can't be judged then. You should be thanking God for my lies then because you're calling them lies because they're glorifying God. And so he just flips them. And then in verse 8, and why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil, that good may come. He gives one answer to that. 
their condemnation is just. If you can take this gospel and ever say, let us do evil that good may come, you've lost it. He's going to answer it very thorough as in Romans 6, 1. Should we continue in sin that grace might abound? This gospel of free grace that Jesus Christ has done all, all necessary for our salvation. Well, it won't make you want to sin more. It'll make you want to sin less. And so this gospel will never make you want to just go and sin, 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 that God would be glorified as the God who forgives your sin. This new heart that is circumcised will never, ever say that. Think it, desire it. And if you live in that, he just says, your condemnation is, you're just so anti-gospel. Your condemnation is just. I've laid everything out. I've labored. And if this is where you want to land with the gospel of free grace, your condemnation is just. If you can't have a place for free grace without your works, and without your merit, and to look only to Christ, and just keep sinning with the free gospel. He says, your your condemnation is just. So in my conclusion, the heart of the Jewish argument this morning is how can God make such glorious promises to this nation of salvation, blessing, and future, and now bring judgment upon these ones who are breaking the law. How can God be faithful to judge and faithful to save? There's just no way. There's, they, they can't bring that together in their mind. And so where I want to end, my friends, where this whole thing is moving, Paul's just moving it right to Calvary's hill. He's bringing us to the cross where the righteousness of God and judgment kissed. And so here's the the righteousness of God in His Son and the judgment in His Son. God took His beloved Son and He put Him up on a cross and the sin that God so hates that we did was put upon His Son. And God judged Him thoroughly in our place so that now He can save us by His righteousness. So now He can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. And this is how God is glorified. By the cross where He judges and the righteousness of God saves. By believing this and trusting it with all your heart and giving yourself to Him, not by sinning that grace might abound That is how God gets His glory. It's not by sin indulged, but by sin punished and delivered. And so all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. And so I would cry that you would take the place of David this morning and quit playing games with God. Quit bringing all of your arguments the devil's advocate, just twisting truth and being a liar, trying to make yourself feel innocent, getting counselors to tell you, best friends, just, I just want to be told I'm okay. And where Paul is driving this, come take the place with David. Don't defend yourself before God. You're guilty. Confess God's rightful and righteous judgment upon yourself and your sin. God, you are right to send me to hell forever. If you can't make that confession, you haven't come to Christ. You would be right, God, to punish me in the flames of hell forever. That's what my sin deserves and my rebellion and my hatred. You would be right. I don't have anything to commend myself to God. I can't look to circumcision, baptism, church attendance, being a good guy. I have nothing, God, to commend myself. I can't keep your law. But now, God, you're faithful to save through your son. Kiss the son. Believe on him and be saved. God is true. And this gospel will be true forever and ever and ever. God says, I will save to the uttermost all who draw near to me through him. 
You know, I'll never change that. I'm true. This is salvation, and I offer it freely to anyone who will just make David's confession and own that you're guilty, Jew or Gentile, rejecting and moral or in the church and being a good guy. Both of you are guilty and need salvation. That's the truth of God. Don't be a spin doctor. Don't flip it out and ignore it and make up other truths and go follow cults. This morning you stand right here. Will you own who you are before God? And believe in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will save you from your sin. I close with Hebrews 6. For men swear by one greater than themselves. And with them an oath gives us a confirmation as the end of every dispute. <clears throat> in the same way God, catch this, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose. He, he wants you to get this. He took an oath. God took an oath in order that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie and that he took an oath, we can have strong encouragement. We who have fled for refuge and laying hold of the hope set before us, the gospel of Jesus Christ, this hope we have as an anchor of our soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, even in coronas, and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so I, I pray God wants you to be able to rest on his truthfulness and his promise that the one who will Look, turn away from trying to fix his sin with his own hands and flee only to Jesus Christ. He will give this salvation. And so we thank God for the but now and a remedy for what we have seen in Romans 1 through 2. So let's go to our God and, and ask for this. Father, I pray that no one within the hearing of my voice would keep being a spin doctor, would keep turning and hiding and making arguments so they don't have to deal with the living God. Lord, that is going to end one day. That could end today with their last breath. And when they stand before you, the secrets of their heart are going to be made known. And there's going to be no argument. But God, let it cease today. Let them find a better way to deal with their guilt and their sin and their shame. Let them look upon Jesus Christ and be saved. Let them be healed as they gaze upon the Savior hanging on a cross in their place. Let them repent and turn to this Christ and believe and be saved. And though every man be found a liar, God, you are true and faithful to your promises. Lord, I thank you for this. And I, I stand assured in Christ. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen.